Walking through Rose Canyon in San Diego, visitors often ask, where are the roses? Why do they name this place Rose Canyon? In fact, it wasn't named for roses. The canyon was named after one of its owners, a man who in the mid-19th century built San Diego's first tannery there. This man, who was San Diego's first Jewish settler and entrepreneur, also gave his name to Rose Creek, the Robinson Rose House in Old Town San Diego, Roseville in the Point Loma area, and to Lewis Rose Point at Liberty Station. Who was Lewis Rose? And what part did he play in the reshaping and building up of San Diego? Why has history forgotten about him? And why should we remember who he is today? San Diego had very humble beginnings and was not prone to significant or rapid changes throughout the first 80 years of its existence. What sparked innovation and change in 1850? One man, Louis Rose, came on the scene and inspired a town that had remained relatively stagnant in its growth to prosper and flourish and become the great city that it is today. Don Harrison explores the life and legacy of this great man who history has forgotten. San Diego was claimed for Spain by the Portuguese explorer Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo in 1542. But it wasn't until 1769 that the Spaniards decided to create a settlement in the town of San Diego. On this site where I'm standing, today is the Sarah Museum and the flags of Spain, Mexico, and the United States, three countries that ruled San Diego. Understanding this place, known as the Presidio, provides insight into the life and legacy of Louis Rose, who came to San Diego in 1850, 81 years after Gaspar de Portola and Father Junipero Serra established the Spanish settlement here. But why here? Well, the Spaniards had three important criteria for where they would build a fort and a mission. First, it should be high enough to be defensible. Second, it needed to be near a source of fresh water. And the San Diego River is nearby. And third, they wanted a place that was close to Indians who could be converted to Christianity. And there were two small Indian settlements right by here. There were three main places that the Spaniards dwelled from the founding of the settlement in 1769. The first place was, of course, here at the Presidio. Second was at Mission San Diego, which was built about five miles up the San Diego River. And third was the small Fort Guijaros, which guarded the mouth of San Diego Bay. This artwork is a representation of that moment in San Diego history when the soldiers at the Presidio learned that they were no longer Spaniards, that they were now Mexicans. And here we see them taking down the Spanish flag and being ready to uh, hoist the Mexican flag. Born in 1807 in Neuhaus an der Oster, Germany, he migrated to New Orleans in 1840 and came to San Diego by wagon train in 1850. He rented Casa de Reyes Ibanez in Old Town from the Estudillo family and converted it to the commercial house and saloon. Soon he was expanding his business enterprises. Eventually he also had a general store, the tannery, a butcher's shop in Old Town, mining claims, real estate interest, and rights of way for a railroad he hoped would directly link San Diego to the rest of the United States. He became the richest man in early San Diego. Lewis Rose immigrated to San Diego in 1850, the same year that California became the 31st state of the nation and the same year that San Diego became a city. Popular with the people of Old Town, who elected him as a member of the City Board of Trustees and the County Board of Supervisors, Lewis Rose nevertheless was unhappy with the location of Old Town. 
He believed it should be along the shore of the bay, not below the Presidio, where the Spaniards had settled the area in 1769. A location on the water had been profitable for his native Neuhaus, and profitable for New Orleans, the first American city where he lived. In his view, if San Diego were located on the bay, ocean-going ships would unload their cargo here, and a transcontinental railroad surely would choose San Diego as its terminus. Just wait a while and you will see, Rose used to advise everybody. We're standing here in the Casa de Estudio. This was a hacienda that was owned by a very prominent family who came here during the Spanish period and continued living here during the Mexican and the American periods of San Diego history. It's interesting about these haciendas that they were built around the central court to the main plaza and focusing inside. The Estudillo family was the first family that Louis Rose met when he came over the mountains, the Cuyamaca Mountains, in 1850. They owned a ranch in El Cajon, and it was there as he came down the mountain, he was taken in by them, they offered him water and food, he was exhausted, and he found uh, friends who directed him to Old Town, and who uh, eventually rented to him the commercial house on which he had uh, his first business. We're looking at the sala of the Casa de Estudio, where the Estudios would have entertained, and where Louis Rose himself probably was a frequent guest. Robinson and Rose believed a potentially profitable real estate development could link Old Town with another established settlement in La Playa, while bringing the boundaries of commercial San Diego right to the bay, in October, the two friends applied to the city for an adjoining 80 acres of land on the northwest side of the San Diego Bay between La Playa and San Diego. The friends kept adding parcels thereafter to aggregate sufficient land to build a community that eventually would be known as Roseville, and today is a major portion of Point Loma. Along with his friend James W. Robinson, Rose assembled land along the bay but before a new town could be built, a series of tragedies befell Rose. Robinson died. Rose had to sell off Rose Canyon to pay his bills, and the U.S. Civil War broke out, bringing commerce to a standstill. After the war ended and the economy recovered, Rose laid out the town of Roseville, 30 blocks long, 8 blocks wide, he built there a hotel, as well as this area's first pier. Rose made friendships with people of all backgrounds, but he stood by the belief that Jews should marry Jews. German-born merchant Jacob Newman and his wife Matilda were friends of Rose. When Newman left Matilda a widow, it was natural in a small town like San Diego that two people would be thrown together despite the fact that Rose was 29 years older than she was. On April 24, 1869, Rose applied for a marriage license. In honor of his marriage, which came 20 years after his first marriage to Caroline Marks, Rose gave away a number of lots in Roseville, many of them to women who he had invited to take dinner with their families. Louis Rose and Matilda were married on May 18th. This is the Casa de Carrillo. As you can see, the Presidio is behind us and Old Town is over that way. And when the soldiers were able to move down from the Presidio into uh, the Old Town area, this was one of the first houses that was built. And the daughter of this family, Josefa Carrillo, was considered the most beautiful of all the girls uh, in uh, San Diego. And the governor of California, the, the new Mexican governor, uh, fell in love with her. And the problem was that she didn't care for him. She really liked Henry Fitch, who was a American Yankee uh, trader. And uh, Henry so much loved her that he was willing to convert to Catholicism from Protestantism. And uh, he, in fact, did do that. And the next day, they were supposed to be married. But then the governor, Governor H. E. Andia, said, no, you cannot have this wedding. And, and he canceled it. He, he banned it. And at that point, uh, Josefa said to Henry, whispered in his ear, why don't you carry me away, Enrique? So the next day from this very, very house that evening, 
Josefa came out into this area that was known as the Pear Garden. Today it's a nine-hole uh, municipal golf course. And uh, waiting for her with two horses was Pio Pico, who someday would become the last governor of California, Mexican governor of California. And Pio Pico and, and Josefa rode to the, to the sh shore where two ships were waiting. One was Henry's and one was another ship. And to throw the authorities off, they jumped on the other ship and they set sail. But they had to get past Fort Guijaros with its guns. And would the governor's men get to the fort before the ship could get there? And would their ship be blown out? And, and so they were holding each other and hugging each other on the deck of the ship, hoping to escape. And they did. They, they sailed right under the guns of Fort Guijaros and they went down to Chile and they eloped. And it was the most famous romance in San Diego history. And what does this have to do with Louis Rose? In 1869, when he got, was married, he bought this property, the Pear Garden, for his new wife, Matilda, as a wedding gift. Rose sold some lots in Roseville and gave away others, many to the women of families who had kindly invited him to dinner during the years of his bachelorhood. But his time had passed. He had a better finance competitor in Alonzo Horton, who built what is today's downtown, attracting the very same businesses Rose had hoped to bring to Roseville. As a result, Horton, and not Rose, became celebrated as the father of modern San Diego. But if Horton is the father, Surely Rose is San Diego's uncle. And while San Diego never realized Rose's dream of becoming the terminus of a transcontinental railroad, the city did get a spur line from Los Angeles. In 1854, the San Diego and Gila Southern Pacific and Atlanta Railroad Company was organized by Louis Rose and James Robinson. The San Diego Board of Trustees where both men also served as board members, granted the newly formed railroad company a subsidy of 8,850 acres. Unfortunately, Robinson died in 1857, and along with the outbreak of the Civil War, the San Diego Gila Southern Pacific was unable to raise the capital needed to continue the development of their plan. The land grant was later transferred to the Memphis, El Paso, and Pacific Railroad, which also faced red tape issues and failed to obtain the necessary land grant from Congress. This plan included a terminus near Horton's Wharf. Finally, in 1871, when the Texas Pacific Railroad Company was chartered by an act of Congress, it looked like the original dreams and plans of Lewis Rose and James Robinson would come to fruition, but would not include the men themselves. To Rose and his wife, were born two daughters, Helene and Henrietta. But then Helene died in infancy, and Matilda died soon afterwards. Old man Rose was left to bring up Henrietta alone, and when his health began to fail and blindness set in, Rose had to give up his enterprises. Louis Rose also helped in the development of San Diego's Jewish community. He was a part of Congregation Adat Yeshurun that met in each other's homes, especially on important Jewish holidays. He hosted High Holy Day services at the Robinson Rose House in Old Town. It was there too that he helped to form the town's Hebrew Benevolent Society. He officiated at one of the first Jewish weddings in San Diego, and he donated land in the Roseville area for San Diego's first Jewish cemetery. Amid state and local political developments, there were some important fraternal and religious occurrences that would prove important to a small community of Jews in San Diego. Creation of a Masonic organization in San Diego and the first observance of Jewish High Holy Days. Rose died in 1888, and six years later, a new elementary school was opened in Roseville. Henrietta became its first school teacher.
There are four symbols on this uh, stone. Uh, on the upper left, uh, there is Lewis Rose Society, which is the Society for the Preservation of Jewish History. And Henrietta actually was buried in an unmarked grave. And when the society learned where she was buried, uh, it decided to erect this particular stone. Uh, choosing a stone from uh, the Cuyamaca is something that would perhaps uh, suggest uh, the journey that her father, Louis Rose, had made to this country. On the right-hand side, uh, top right, is a star of the Eastern Star, which is a order of the Masons, Women's Order of the Masons, and, and Henrietta served as a president of the San Diego chapter in 1901. On the lower left is the logo of the San Diego uh, City Schools, and Henrietta was a teacher for about 50 years uh, in the various places that are mentioned on the plaque uh, at Roseville Elementary School, which uh, later became Cabrillo Elementary School, Middletown Elementary School, Sherman Elementary School, and Roseville Junior High School. And finally, on the right hand lower corner is San Diego Education Association, and that's the teachers' union. Uh, and of course, she was uh, a teacher for a long time. And so all four of these organizations paid their respects to her when uh, her unmarked grave was finally marked. Louis Rose and Sarah Robinson, two old friends uh, who came to San Diego in the same wagon train in 1850. How long have you been doing this? Uh, I have been training Louis Rose for 21 years. That you want people to know about Louis Rose? Well, being a Jewish origin myself, I felt it was important for somebody to portray the Jewish, uh, the Jewish character in this road. And because he was a very important person here at Old Town. First of all, he was a very uh, friendly man. He was a giving man. He was philanthropic. Aside from the fact that in 1953, 1853, he was the richest man in San Diego. Uh, and one of the things that's very important to me as a Jewish person is to talk about the interaction of the small Jewish community with the larger non-Jewish community here in Old Town. This mezuzah was donated to the state parks by Jim Milch, uh, an attorney in San Diego who is a great collector of uh, Judaica and uh, things relevant to the Jewish community here in San Diego. It's a, uh, an, an original 19th century mezuzah. And we have it on the building, the Robinson Rose building, to commemorate uh, the ownership of the building in its uh, original context uh, by Louis Rose. Louis Rose Point was dedicated in 2004, on the 350th anniversary of Jewish settlement in the United States. Cities across the country decided to mark places that uh, had some Jewish influence, and the city of San Diego chose this area to um, memorialize and commemorate the Jewish settlement in San Diego. My name is Norman Green. I'm president of the Lewis Rose Society for the Preservation of Jewish History in San Diego. We're here at the San Diego airport today to welcome our two guests from Neuhaus an der Oster, Germany, the birthplace of Lewis Rose. Our two guests are the principal and a teacher who will be spending some time with us at the Cabrillo Elementary School, which was uh, the forerunner was, was created by Lewis Rose and his daughter Henrietta Rose was the first teacher there. The schools began exchanging letters as part of their international sister school program and continue to do so to this day, as well as video exchanges and emails. When this monument to Lewis Rose was dedicated, 
twin rose bushes were planted by students of Cabrillo Elementary School, which is located nearby. It was to represent their school as well as the Grundschule in Neuhaus an der Oste, an elementary school in the town where Louis Rose grew up. This educational relationship extended further when the principal and a teacher of the school from Neuhaus came for a goodwill visit to Cabrillo Elementary in October of 2012. Not only did the school welcome them with open arms and a school-wide assembly, but afforded the German educators an opportunity to meet their American counterparts and run a short German lesson for one of the classes. The German visitors toured the school and spent the day chatting with their American peers. The Grundschule principal Doris Henningsen and teacher Dorothea Fetz of Neuhaus discuss what kinds of projects the two schools can develop for their pupils' mutual benefit. Later, in their San Diego visit, they were treated to a traditional Shabbat dinner by the members of the Lewis Rose Society. Shabbat starts a few minutes before sunset when candles are lit, and it is customary to sing two songs and praise the women of the house. After blessings over wine and challah, a festive meal is served. To enjoy Shabbat is to engage in pleasurable activities such as eating, singing, and spending time with family and friends. This occasion, with Jewish folk music and Manashevitz wine, added to the celebration of international friendship. Today, Louis Rose lies along with other Jewish pioneers at the Home of Peace Cemetery. His daughter, Henrietta, who served in 1901 as president of an Eastern Star chapter, is buried at the nearby Mount Hope Cemetery. She was the last of Rose's line. But the memory of Louis Rose lives on in the place names reflecting some of the high points of his 81-year-long life, the songs and shouts of happy schoolchildren in two countries.